Hello, friends. Welcome back to the School Transportation Nation podcast this week. I'm Tony Corcoran, publisher of STN. This episode is brought to you by TransFinder, the leader in school bus routing software. Stay tuned for special messages from Zonar and Safety Vision as well. And don't forget to go on the STN website to check out our brand new August edition digital STN online.com and look for that August edition there on our homepage. Hello, welcome back. I'm Ryan Gray, Editor-in-Chief of School Transportation News. A little bit later on, I'll be speaking with our special guest, Anthony Pollard, who's the Transportation Supervisor for Baldwin County's Board of Education in Alabama. Thanks for that, Ryan. We'll look forward to hearing from Tony Pollard. Well, it's been a bit of an upheaval in the economy lately. Uh, We're seeing a lot of activity out there. Ryan, what's going on? Give us an update. Yeah, so last week was the second consecutive week of unemployment spikes after we saw about four months of declines. It feels hard to believe. Seems like the economy has not been doing so hot for years now, uh, but it's only been about five months since uh, COVID really broke. Uh, But what we had seen with the state's reopening back in June and certainly through July, the economy was getting a little bit back to where it had been. Still, things are not looking good, but we were seeing some really promising numbers where applications for the unemployment insurance were, were dropping. Well, as the New York Times reported last week, 1.45 million new Americans filed for unemployment. I mentioned that's the second uh, straight week of increases after nearly four months of decline. Meanwhile, consumer spending dropped a record 10.1% last month. Making things worse is uh, this week, a lot of folks that are on unemployment, they're not going to be receiving that additional $600 in their paycheck, their unemployment paycheck, because Congress left D.C. last week without a deal on the next round of coronavirus stimulus. So a lot of people have been looking at that and hoping to get another $1,200 per individual or $2,400 for a married couple or filing jointly plus $500 for dependents. We'll have a little bit more on that soon. But, you know, certainly it's going to be at least another week or two before Congress is going to address this and hopefully get some assistance back out to folks. Now, one of the many concerns really on student transporters is if there are a lot of people out there drawing these additional unemployment checks, i.e. school bus drivers, what's the impetus for them to come back, especially amid all the fears and the concern about contracting the virus, the older ages and underlying health conditions of drivers. So it's something certainly that uh, the industry wants to keep an eye on. In the short term, this may will be a boom to get some more drivers to return to schools. Who knows? We'll have to see. Yeah, man, Ryan, that sounds like a pretty complicated situation for sure. You know, our tech tip this week has a suggestion for your back to school planning as it gets tricky out there. It's brought to you by Zonar, a leader in smart fleet management. Planning for back to school is complicated right now. What you need may or may not exist, but you still need it. Partner with Zonar's in-house professionals to build it, custom reports, real-time data streams, the unique projects that extend your technology's capabilities. Zonar's standardized processes eliminates roadblocks so projects are up and running quickly. Flexible is crucial. Work with experts who work with you. Learn more at zonarsystems.com slash protect. That's zonarsystems.com slash protect. I also want to remind our listeners about our Bus Technology Summit coming up. It's going to be virtual September 22nd through the 24th. Registration is going to be opening real soon. Check out our website, bustechsummit.com to learn more. We got lots of cool things on tap for you. Mr. Ryan Gray is cooking up great sessions in his uh, laboratory. So we're excited to see what he brings to us. And we're uh, working with a lot of our key technology partners to come forward with great ideas and conversations for you guys to learn more about what's the uh, pulse of tech out there and what's coming here in the future. So, Ryan, uh, tell us more about the HEALS Act. Lots of legislation cooking. That's a big one. 
Yeah, the HEALS Act. So that's H-E-A-L-S Act. And that is the Republican answer to the House Democrats version of the HEROES Act, uh, which is going to eventually morph into this next COVID-19 stimulus that I was mentioning. So now, as I said, uh, everyone left town last week. They're going to be gone on recess for a week. We'll see where they go with this uh, legislation in August. Certainly, the time is ticking. But I was looking at the HEALS Act, and what it says, as I mentioned, it would be $1,200 more for individuals and $2,400 for joint filers, $500 for all dependents. It's a $1 million legislation, again, Republican-led. It's aiming to continue those unemployment benefits as well that I mentioned that have now expired. So initially, that means $200 more a week, then up to $500 more to match 70% of lost wages would add to state benefits. It's not quite as much as the $600 in the original CARES Act that President Trump signed into law at the end of March or the House Democrats plan, the latter, which would have extended these unemployment benefits through next March. That certainly would not bode well for a lot of school districts and and bus companies that are trying to get drivers back. But the HEALS Act would actually stop these additional UI payments at the end of this year. So still, it's getting pretty dicey out there with in terms of folks running their school districts, running their businesses, and trying to rely on employees. Either way, you know, obviously, this could negatively impact and affect the ability to get drivers in the seats. What else is in the HEALS Act? K-12 public and private schools that reopen for in-person classes would receive about $47 billion out of the total $70 billion that's available for education. That's up from $58 billion in the House Democrats' HEROES Act, but far below the $175 billion that was requested by the National Association of Elementary School Principals. That's according to Education Week. The remaining third of funds would go to all schools, regardless of their plans. And additionally, governors would receive $5 billion to use on K-12 and higher education. Education. Still, as I mentioned, it's not enough money, according to a lot of educators are saying, and, and certainly transportation is down the totem pole, rightfully or not, in terms of the programs that a lot of school districts are operating. So that's a concern. There is some good news, though. Small businesses would be eligible for $190 million in new loans. It also eliminates the requirement under the current payroll protection program, the PPP, that money be used on payroll. So this expands the use of the money and also expands loan forgiveness. Something that's brand new in the HEALS Act is that employees who start new jobs or are rehired could receive a return to work bonus of up to $450 a week. So that could be something that maybe cancels out or at least balances out the unemployment benefits. What the HEALS Act also addresses that the other plans didn't or don't is they would create a five-year liability shield for schools, businesses, and hospitals from being sued over coronavirus-related issues. And it also provides $16 million for COVID-19 testing. Yeah, Ryan, that's sure a lot of money to be thrown around. I'm sure there'll be lots of processes to apply for those funds and uh, definitely hope it helps out some of our uh, supplier partners out there as well as our school districts. That funding is definitely needed. And I really hope the legislators can pull it together and get some of this stuff passed because that's really needed with the upcoming school year. And speaking of that, Everyone wants to get kids back to school in the safest manner possible. And now more than ever, Safety Vision is dedicated to ensuring that with our safety tip this week. Since school bus transportation is the first point of possible transmission for students, they have introduced an onboard contact-free temperature reader hardwired into the bus for hands-free operation. It requires no driver interaction, unlike using handheld thermometers, which break the social distancing guidelines. It can read temperatures quickly so it will not impact route times whatsoever. Their inventory is going fast, so contact Clint Breyer and his school bus team at 800-880-8855. Send them an email at schoolbussales at safetyvision.com and learn more about the variety of technology products at Safety Vision over at safetyvision.com. Well, Ryan, there's been some controversy over returning to school because of the risks. We're definitely seeing uh, a lot out there. Parents not happy. Teachers not happy. It can go either way. Want to get back to school. Don't want to get back to school. It's kind of a tug of war. I feel like everywhere around the country, there's no like hard and fast. What's the industry saying about this? 
Well, we got a, a bit of a sneak peek at what some uh, school might look like, thanks to our friends down at the school district of Manatee County on the Florida Gulf Coast. We shared a video from them on our Facebook page last week. You might have caught it. If not, head over to facebook.com forward slash STN mag. Like many districts nationwide, is offering students and parents the option for several different education models. The five-day in-person, all in-class learning, to five-day hybrid model of a couple days in-class, several days home remote, and then that full online-only model. For those students who choose to go back to in-person classes, at least partially, Manatee County produced a video that, again, they put on their Facebook page, and it shows how students will be distanced in the classroom and outside during lunch breaks. They didn't show school buses. They did mention school buses, but basically face coverings are, are mandatory for all students and staff on site. Check out, again, our Facebook page to view that video. Meanwhile, the New York Times published an opinion article last week that suggested that schools can safely, if not normally, reopen for in-person education and activities during this new school year. It's authored by Ezekiel J. Emanuel, the Vice Provost of Global Initiatives and Professor of Medical Ethics and Health Policy at the University of Pennsylvania, Saskia Popescu, an infectious disease epidemiologist, and James Phillips, the Chief of Disaster Medicine at George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences. The TRIO has developed what they call the K-12 School Relative Risk Index. The first column addresses transportation to school. It ranges from the lowest risks, those being walking and biking to school and being driven by a family member, to the highest, school buses and transit buses. In the middle is the moderate risk of carpooling or being driven by a non-household member. The tool lumps school bus transportation along with indoor eating in cafeterias, band, choir, drama performances, contact sports, and locker rooms as activities that should be avoided. So not good news in terms of a lot of folks trying to get kids back in class and obviously getting school buses rolling again. Certainly, as we've talked about, though, there are populations of students mainly special needs, some students that experience homeless and and who are in foster care that might still be needing rides to school. But definitely it's looking pretty sad out there in terms of seeing all these kids wearing masks and being distanced apart while they're eating lunch. It's just our new reality. Yeah, it's definitely tough, Ryan. I mean, everybody is uh, stressed for sure. And, you know, it's it's about being ready, though. When the call comes, transportation has to be ready for the task. And it's definitely something that we need to have as an industry, our fingers on the pulse of what's going on out there. Our friends at TransFinder have a message for school transportation officials who feel stuck in a hard place. With school opening just around the corner, TransFinder's RouteFinder Plus is the solution to your problem. Here's what our friends at TransFinder are looking for. The self-starter kind, the roll up your sleeves and figure it out kind, the all look it up on YouTube kind, the all do whatever it takes kind, the glass is half full kind, the no excuses kind. If this describes you, it's time to join the TransFinder family to change how school bus routing gets done. RouteFinder Plus is the most powerful web-based routing solution on the market today period. It's faster. With Plus, you can quickly create routes and stops. It's safer. You can prohibit students from crossing the street to get to their bus. It's smarter. Sequence optimization tools create the best sequence to optimize for time or distance. Plus also helps you analyze data. Email getplus at transfinder.com and put STN podcast in the subject line or call 800-373-3609. We've got this together. Stay tuned to hear from our friend, Transportation Supervisor, Tony Pollard. We're now joined by Anthony Pollard, Transportation Supervisor for Baldwin County Board of Education in Alabama, right across the bay from Mobile. He has 20 years of military experience in addition to his transportation experience. He's with the National Guard down there in Alabama. He's taught every grade from K through 12, coached football, soccer, started his own successful janitorial business in college, and is now an author. So we'll get a little bit into that. But first, Tony, we want to talk to you about School Startup. How are you doing? 
Yeah, we're, we're doing great. Everybody's excited. The guys are strung out, but they're excited to roll and we're ready to get it going. Lots of work to be done. Last week, your governor, Kay Ivey, announced that all students in second grade and higher will be required to wear masks. What does that mean for your school bus routes? So we had already had in plan that we were going to require at least sort of have a mandate that when the kids got on the bus, they would come on the bus with a mask. Obviously, I don't want my poor drivers having to worry about fighting with that with a kid that's going to argue with them or give them grief. We set up some isolation seats for those kids that refused to wear a mask, and then the school would deal with that. But then when she made the mandate, this made this so much easier for us because now they'll have to come on with the mask. We don't have to worry about this being an issue for the drivers. And then obviously with that mandate that, you know, the kindergarten through first grade, they don't have to wear a mask. So we're not going to make a big deal about that anyway. But I wanted to take that pressure off of the drivers because they don't need to worry about that. They need to concentrate on driving and feeling safe. So Exactly. And then there's the students with disabilities, right? We actually talked last week with a doctor from UCLA and we've seen a lot of guidance that says, hey, we really need to be careful about the students with disabilities because they could have conditions that the mask could exacerbate. You can't see them if they're nonverbal, those kind of things. How are you dealing with that? That's been a big concern for us. So for all of our drivers, and we're very lucky in this district to have paraeducators that ride all our buses. So the county has ordered them the face guards for those people. So they don't have to have their face, their mouth covered up, but they are protected from their eyes down. And that way, when we have these students that can't wear a mask at all, they're protected. The kids that can't hear, they can see their face, they can read lips. So we wanted to give that to the drivers and to the paraeducators. So that's how we've covered those bases with those particular students. Okay. And then Superintendent Eddie Tyler there for Baldwin County, a former school bus driver, I learned. Yes. <laughs> that's got to be cool having a superintendent who knows everything that the school bus drivers are dealing with. We are very lucky and he's very supportive of transportation. My team submitted our plan to him probably over a month ago. We have 32,000 students. We transport 17,000 of those. At least 5,000 of them have decided to go to virtual school. I'm telling you that all for a reason because he supports that and our plan basically says let's really encourage parents bringing kids to school as car riders so we can try to limit kids on the bus because we're not able with 2,200 square miles, we're not able to social distance on the bus like some districts can. They're going to be on the bus. They're going to be sitting beside each other. And so with his support, we've given him our guidelines on how to, we need to sanitize the buses, how we need to train drivers for that, and how we need to prepare our students to get on the bus. So as soon as they enter the bus, they're going to have hand sanitizers they have to clean their hands with. And when they get off the bus that, or during the ride, they need to keep their mask on. And then the PM route, they would have to sanitize their hands as soon as they get on the bus. So that was part of our plan for dealing with that with students, and he was very supportive of that. And then what about taking temperatures? A lot of school districts we're talking to are wanting to wait until the kids get to their campus because no one wants to turn away a kid at the school bus stop. You don't know if their parents are home. You know, what about their age? What about being ostracized by other students? That whole bullying aspect comes into it. How are you doing with that? That was one of our concerns as well. And I immediately... Like I said, our districts, it's rural, but some of it's urban. And at 2,200 square miles, the last thing I need is a driver to refuse a child to get on the bus and that parent's already at work. And then we find this kid walking down the road, and that will happen in this district. So I told the county before they even came up with a plan, I said, I can't have drivers taking temperature. That's why we developed, let's have the two front passenger seats open as isolation seats. When we get them to school, if they're feeling sick, that we'll immediately notify whoever's on duty, a principal or administrator, and they will isolate them from there and work that part out. But we wanted to take that off the driver's plate. And what about dividers? Uh, we've seen some districts, some states uh, allowing these, whether they be some kind of plexiglass or plastic, soft plastic dividers that partitions the school bus driver away from the kids. Is that something, where, where does Alabama fall on that? Well, we talked to our state inspectors about that and it doesn't look, because that would, you, you can't retrofit the bus, you can't change the bus, you can't change the state specs and we'd have to drill some of those things in. And so they were concerned about that. We looked at it. 
But we really thought the main goal here was if we provide the face mask, the face shields for the drivers and the paraeducators, I'm talking about special needs drivers there, and then require all our drivers to wear masks. And with that said, so with our drivers, we ordered them all these sport masks like sports teams would wear. It's cooling. It, it's so when if it gets wet, it helps keep their skin cool. We ordered all those for the drivers. And so we're providing those for the drivers instead of dividers. Now, speaking of the drivers or your other staff, for that matter, what about retention? Are you running into a lot of your employees that are saying, hey, we're really scared about coming back or we're not coming back at all? You know, it's been a mixed bag and we have the oldest department and I think most districts in the United States have when their transportation is usually the oldest department. Some of our drivers are mid 70s. I think we have one that's 80. You know, I'm, I'm worried about them. They're fearful for, you know, getting sick. And so the goal was to give them some peace of mind. But we also have been out of work since March. So talking to the union, which is the AEA, these drivers want to come back to work. They want to make sure they're going to have pay. And when the state of Alabama, for us, they, they all have benefits. They don't want to lose those benefits, so they're very excited about coming to work. But they are. there's a few that are a little fearful, and we, I think we've lost three or four, but we haven't lost as many as I thought we might lose having the older department. So we're very excited about that. Now, on the technology front, Governor Ivey also made some news last month when she made available $10 million for school bus Wi-Fi routers. What's Baldwin County's uh, interest level in Wi-Fi on school buses? We were very lucky because when schools went virtual, when everything went down with COVID, our district offered little pucks for every student to come pick up at the school. They had the little Google Chromebooks that they took home. And so they were issued, if they needed Wi-Fi and they needed internet service, they were offered the little pucks. And they still have those pucks. So if it becomes an issue again, they'll have those pucks available to them. Now, I've spoken to our IT director, and I, I shared with him this. He didn't know about the information about the $10 million. And so we submitted a couple of things, but we both had decided to wait until after school settles in because they have issued this $10 million, but they really haven't said, okay, how are you going to get it? Is it going to last more than one year? There's a lot of variables that we don't have answers to yet. But I know our district in general has said, hey, we're already providing these pucks if school shuts down again or if kids need Internet at any time, the pucks are available to them. Okay. And uh, so earlier I mentioned when I introduced you that you're an author now. Yes, sir. Books coming out or it's come out already driven by the heart, a guide to passionate living. It's about unlocking one's true potential. Tell us about that a little bit. How did that come to play? Well, actually, this job, taking over transportation, led to me having to speak in front of large groups. And I started going to a, a thing called Toastmasters. A lot of people don't know about it. And it just led to me speaking. So a business called me in. It's a local business here. They, they're an electric co-op. They called me and asked me to do their Veterans Day program. I went and spoke to this group, and they all liked what I had to share. And so I started speaking more throughout my district, and then a couple of business started calling me. I said, well, you got to have – let me share some of these stories. And I started writing. So I, I've written one book and it's sort of just like a little one chapter book. But then that book led to me saying, you know, there's so much more in life. And this book is really, it's an eight chapter book, but it's chock full of little mini stories. And they're little vignettes and they're, they're vignettes about my life. And we all have a purpose. Like you have a purpose, I have a purpose. And when we find our true heart's calling, we really go out there and live it fully. So that's what this book is about, it's sharing those little stories, little vignettes, and living a passionate life. I told someone yesterday, living in a perpetual state of discomfort, and I don't mean that in a bad way, if we're ignoring the outside noises around us and we're just taking charge of our life completely and fully. So it's this book is sort of a memoir, but it's little vignettes of people's lives. So it might be my little basic story of, I might say, a, a heart of gentleness. If I was gentle, I raised my daughter as a single parent. So I had a heart of gentleness in that raising her. But then I also tell the story of someone else who may be famous or actually changed the world with a heart of gentleness. So each little chapter and each little story within it. It's a story, and then it's also someone who was famous or someone we read their books and their life story, and it tells their little story along with it and how that fit in. 
Well, great. Uh, I don't want to give it away. I know you mentioned it's a, it's a bit of a memoir as well. So there was some adversity that you overcame uh, as a youngster. So where could uh, our audience find your book? Is it on Amazon? It's on Amazon. You can pre-order it now for 99 cents with Kindle. It launches August 15th. And to find it, there's two or three Tony Pollards. But if you type in Tony Pollard, it'll pop right up and it's driven by the heart, a guide to passionate living. And you'll see both of my books right there. Well, congratulations. Looking forward to some great things from you, Tony. Thanks so much, Ryan. Thank you, Tony and Claudia as well. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing what's going on down in Baldwin County, Alabama. Thanks to Tony Corpin. Thank you to all our audience for again, hanging with us and coming on this podcast. Also want to thank our sponsors, TransFinder, Zonar and Safety Vision. Remember to check out our website for the latest on what's happening at the federal, state, and local levels as it relates to school transportation and folks dealing with COVID-19. Stay safe and we'll see you next time.